Before we uh, go on to the next uh, speaker, who we're going to be connecting here, um, I thought that I would, uh, I, wanted, I wanted to mention this uh, packet of materials that Russ Swikert brought, um, and he put our schedule on the back, but this, these are some, a packet of some materials that he compiled that he wanted people to see, and we have copies of his thing out there on the, on the table. Um, I thought I would, I would start with reading a few of the things that uh, I thought over a long time reflect some of the themes that are important to what we've done and where we are. Uh, starting in 1785 with uh, James Madison. Of all the enemies to public liberty, war is perhaps the most to be dreaded because it comprises and develops the germ of every other. War is the parent of armies. From these proceed debts and taxes, and armies and debts and taxes are the known instruments for bringing the many under the domination of the few. In War II, the discretionary power of the executive is extended. Its influence in dealing out offices, honors, and emoluments is multiplied, and all the means of seducing the minds are added to those of subduing the force of the people. The same malignant aspect in republicanism may be traced to the inequality of fortunes and the opportunities of fraud growing out of a state of war and in the degeneracy of manners and morals engendered by both. War is in fact the true nurse of executive aggrandizement. In war a physical force is to be created and it is to it is the executive will which is to direct it. In war, the public treasures are to be unlocked, and it is the executive war hand. War is, in fact, the true nurse of executive anger -nizing. In war, a physical force is to be created, and it is, to, it is the executive will which is to direct it. In war... <laughs> in case you didn't get that part of what I said. It is the executive hand which is to dispense them. In war, the honors and emoluments of office are to be multiplied. And it is the executive patronage which, under which they are to be enjoyed. It is in war, finally, that laurels are to be gathered. And it is the executive brow that they are to encircle. The strongest passions and most dangerous weaknesses of the human breast, ambition, avarice, vanity, the honorable or venal love of fame are all in conspiracy against the desire and the duty of peace. Hence, it has grown into an axiom that the executive is the department of power most distinguished by its propensity to war. Hence, it is the practice of all states in proportion as they are free to disarm this propensity of its influence. No nation could preserve its freedom in the midst of continual warfare. Is he speaking to you? In 2010? Second reading is on March 25th, 1965, having completed the third march to Montgomery, the city that gave birth to the Civil Rights Movement, Dr. King spoke these words on the steps of the Alabama State Capitol. I know you're asking today, how long will it take? And I come to you this afternoon, however difficult the moment, however frustrating the hour, it will not be long, because truth crushed to earth will rise again. How long? Not long, because no lie can live forever. How long? Not long, because you shall reap what you sow. How long? Not long, because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. That's 65. Now I want to take it up to current day language. And this is a um, hip-hop piece that I recently saw on YouTube. And I'm sorry that I didn't get the artist's name on what I printed out, but I'm sure you can Google uh, the theme and to find it. Uh, the title is, uh, What If the Tea Party Was Black? What if the Tea Party was black, holding guns like the Black Panther Party was back? 
if Al was Rush Limbaugh and Jesse was Sean Hannity and Tavis was Glenn Beck, would they harm the families? If Sarah Palin was suddenly Sister Soldier, would they leave it with the votes or go to get the soldiers? Y'all know if the Tea Party was black, the government would have been had the army attack. What if Minister Farrakhan prayed for the death of the commander in chief that he be laid to rest? Would they treat it as the gravest threat or never make an arrest? Even today, he's still hated for less. What if President Obama would have lost the election, quit his job so he could talk to the left and bash the government for being off a of direction, fraught with deception, and told black people they want all our weapons and we want our own country and called for secession? Would he be arrested and tossed in corrections for trying to foster aggression against the people's lawful selection? Our questions, what if the Tea Party was black, holding guns like the Black Panther Party was back? What if black people went on Facebook and made a page that for the death of the president-elect we prayed? Would the creators be tased and thrown in a cage? We know the page wouldn't have been displayed at all these days. What if Jeremiah Wright said that everybody white wasn't a real American? Would you feel scared of him? If he had a militia with pictures that depict the president as Hitler, would they kill and bury that? Wait, what if Cynthia McKinney lamented the winning of the new president and hinted he wasn't really a true president with no proof or evidence? Would the media treat it like a huge press event? Would they have attacked whatever group she represents? They would have called for her a kook or on precedent, and any network that gave her due preference would be the laughing stock of the news. So our question is, what if the Tea Party was black, holding guns like the Black Panther Party was back? If Al was Rush Limbaugh and Jesse was Sean Hannity and Tavis was Glenn Beck, would they harm the families? If Sarah Palin was suddenly Sister Soldier, would they leave it with the votes or go to get the soldiers? You all know if the Tea Party was black, the government would have been had the army attack. So, I don't know how our hookup is. Okay, She's, she cannot do it while we're on the phone, so I told her to start in five minutes. All right. So, we should get well, I can go for five minutes and a few of the other themes, and then I'll introduce her. Well, maybe I'll introduce her now just so we'd be sure we don't run over. I had the privilege of working in Congress for Cynthia McKinney. Strangely enough, I won't say who it was, but one of the speakers that asked to speak here when I sent him the agenda canceled and said he wouldn't speak here because Cynthia McKinney was speaking. And I asked him to tell me what the problem was. Uh, I would generally say that if you don't like Cynthia McKinney, you don't know Cynthia McKinney. If you know the Cynthia McKinney on Fox News, you don't know Cynthia McKinney. And she's a principled and very progressive activist in Congress, a tremendous heart, tremendous courage, and of course they went after her. I made the parallel to Cyril Wecht. Cyril Wecht was given 85 different federal charges. He was vilified in the press. He was convicted by the accusation. He was ruined financially. This was the first president of the Coalition on Political Assassinations, the former president of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, who came out early on and said that they were lying about the Kennedy assassination. They confiscated not only his books, which was supposed to be the evidence uh, that they had about the federal crimes, they confiscated all of his Kennedy and other research over the years into uh, deaths and autopsies and things that he had done and kept that from him for years. And eventually, when it got to court, with a prosecutor that had been part of the political appointment of uh, Gonzales, the attorney general, which came out in the news later, this attorney brought these 85 separate federal charges for every little thing she could see or thought she saw. And when it got to court, Weck didn't even put on a defense. The prosecution was so weak that the judge threw it out. Then she came back with 26 charges, dropped most of them, and at that point all those were thrown out, and then she had the audacity to get on TV and say that just because all those charges were thrown out and they couldn't bring them, it didn't mean that that Cyril Wecht was innocent. Well, Cynthia McKinney was vilified in the news for an incident with the Capitol Police. 
there's a rule in Congress since its inception that no one can interfere with a congressperson on the way to a vote. They can't be arrested. They can't be detained. Why? Because you can influence an outcome of a vote. So Cynthia McKinney was on her way to a vote through the Longworth House office building, and the rules there, even since 9-11, are that a Congress member does not have to pass through a gate, a security gate. They can walk right in. Now, the job of the Capitol Police is to recognize members of Congress because it's their job to protect members of Congress. If they can't recognize a member of Congress in a crowd, how can they know who they're supposed to protect? A 16-year-old page has to take a test before they can be a page of showing them random pictures of the members of the Congress and which side of the house that they work on or want to work on, and if they can't identify them, they're not going to be a page. These are professionals trained in facial recognition who are supposed to recognize the members of Congress. She was not a fresh entity in Congress. She was on her sixth term when this happened. She had been there a long time. But the, the Hill, the Capitol newspaper, reported that during her earlier terms, at least ten times that they covered it, they, they, they had not recognized Cynthia McKinney on the, at the gate. Not recognized her. I said, if you can't tell black women apart, let them all in. And so this guy yelled at her, followed her down the hall, physically grabbed her, and then she had some response. It's not on camera. I don't know. I never bothered to ask her what her response was. She's a relatively petite woman, and this is a cop over six feet, pretty heavy, grabbing her from behind. Maybe her hand flew up, or maybe she said, let go of me, because she's a member of Congress. She's ready to go interview. Okay. And, and the, uh, the situation is, I mean, they, uh, people say, like, well, this isn't a race issue. Let me tell you, if a black member of the Capitol Police had accosted a white male or female member of Congress in that fashion, how long do you think he would have worked there? Three times after I was working with her during that term, the police came up with flowers to apologize for not recognizing her. The chief of the Capitol Police put his picture up, her picture up, not any other picture, her picture up, so that his officers could recognize her. The black Capitol Police officers told us later that they overheard the white police, Capitol Police officers saying they were laying in wait for Cynthia at the gate to harass her. And I'm sure that, that was, this was part of One member of the Republican Party saw it. He reported it to Hastert, the speaker, who's in charge of the, of the sergeant at arms. And the sergeant at arms, in turn, told the cop to bring a charge. This was after the cop showed up that morning and went in her office to apologize to her for not recognizing her. And then Fox, Hold, Fox News got hold of it, and it became a crime that she had committed against the Capitol Police until finally it went to a grand jury who ruled ignoramus, which means ignore it, there's nothing here, there's no charge brought. But instead of her name being exonerated in the press, the Capitol Police Officers Association went after the federal prosecutor that failed to get the conviction they wanted. Okay. All right. Uh, Cynthia McKinney. I just wanted to tell you something else about who she is. That I read oh, you got her sound in? and spoke before President Ahmadinejad. Yeah, go ahead. It is an honor and my pleasure to be with you this evening on the occasion of International Day of Peace. What we have learned is that it is one thing to have a day it is quite another to have peace. But I know that everyone in this room is committed first and foremost to the United Nations' own Universal Declaration of I guess we're only getting audio feed at the moment. Human rights. All right. And if it were observed by every member... 
the state of the United Nations, we could truly celebrate a world in peace. In fact, our former president, John F. Kennedy, cited the topic of world peace as the most important topic on earth. Sadly, not only are we not on the path of peace today, incredibly, we're on the path of global conflagration. John Kennedy's admonition is more relevant today than ever. He asked, what kind of peace do we seek? And answered his own question this way, not a Pax Americana enforced on the world by American weapons of war, not the peace of the grave or the security of the slave. I'm talking about genuine peace, the kind of peace that makes life on earth worth living, the kind that enables men and nations to grow and to hope and to build a better life for their children. Not merely peace for Americans, but peace for all men and women. Not merely peace in our time, but peace for all time. At no other time in the life of our country were the forces for justice and peace so strong. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. reminded us that the arc of the moral universe bends toward justice. John Kennedy pulled back from war against Castro's Cuba. Malcolm X excited Black America, made Hodge, and broke bread with Dr. King. Bobby Kennedy shocked the conscience of this country and made the impoverished blacks of the Mississippi Delta and the impoverished whites of Appalachia a part of the same dream of America. He also shocked the world by speaking against apartheid, not from the comfort of this country, but inside South Africa and young people inside this country of different races, ethnicities, languages, and incomes united and pressed for justice for Puerto Rico, Mexico, Native Americans, Black Americans against apartheid in South Africa and for peace in Vietnam. We, the popular front, almost won. But we know how that chapter ends. JFK with his brains blown out. Malcolm X betrayed from within the nation. Martin Luther King surrounded by snipers and U.S. military intelligence on his last day alive while those closest to him were on the FBI payroll. And Bobby Kennedy lying in a pool of his own blood after winning the California primary on the road to the White House. The major lesson we must learn and never forget is that those who want to wage war abroad are also willing to wage it at home. So what are we to do? Undaunted, we must organize a peace lobby. A peace lobby grounded in love and truth and respect and human dignity. And we must reach across humanity setting aside what others have successfully used in the past to divide us. Do I believe it can be done? Absolutely, I believe it can be done. But we cannot allow ourselves to be tricked into believing that the ones who got us into war are going to be the ones who lead us out of it. The peace activists in this room understand all of this and also know that if we fail to act now, who will? Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. Now those are the words that I spoke before the president of Iran. And I hope that those words are also relevant to those of you at the COPA meeting right now. I also hope that I will be able to spend some time 
with you as I outlined before. Um, because the work that you're doing is the necessary work. The work that you are doing perhaps can save us from the road that we've traveled before. The unfortunate thing is that surely we are yet again on that road with the grand jury subpoenas of activists who understand just exactly how we almost won before and understand what the necessities are now that we fight the road to tyranny that our country is now on, to those who understand that it is incumbent upon us to struggle against the myriad wars that have been launched by Democratic as well as Republican administrations. It is clear that we are now at a period of danger that everything that the United States proselytizes around the world about what it is, we are about to lose. We must have a body of knowledge and those knowledgeable about what happened in the past so that we can prevent a similar situation from arising in our present and our future. So I hope you have a very good conference this weekend. It's the middle of the night, the middle of the day, the middle of whatever. I don't even know what time it is. I'm across the pond in a different kind of struggle trying to uh, work on behalf of truth and justice and peace in a uh, reconstitution of the Bertrand Russell Tribunal. We know that there were many tribunals of Bertrand Russell, not just on Vietnam, but also in Latin America and this new Bertrand Russell Tribunal is on the situation of Palestine and the complicity of the world in the suffering of the Palestinian people. Yet another reason for us to do everything that we can do here in the United States in order to change the conditions that people suffer around the world as a result of our own policies. Thank you very much for allowing me to be a part of the COPA conference and I hope that next year I am with you at every one of these conferences because it's that important. Thank you, and good night. one way but we were calling people and we also had chats open to them but I don't know if she opened one when you got her up. Well you might you might try calling her on the Skype number and see if she can answer it. She's looking at a laptop. Yes, yeah, she's looking at Carl. She's looking at you Ralph. Congresswoman McKinney was the first African American woman elected to the Georgia Assembly and to Congress. She served six terms in the House of Representatives, ending with the 109th session in 2007. She was the presidential candidate for the Green Party in 2008, and since then she's continued to work for human and civil rights here 
and around the world. She was recently arrested at sea illegally by the Israeli Defense Force while bringing humanitarian aid to Gaza, and she was part of a nationwide bike for peace ride that ended in Washington, D.C. John? Hello? Well, it doesn't, she can't hear me. No. Can you get through to the Skype number? Okay. She's working on her doctorate on the topic of political assassinations, and she's an expert on COINTELPRO, and she introduced the first articles of impeachment against, Pres against President George Bush, and she also introduced the Reverend Martin Luther King Records Act, recently revived in Congress by Senator Kerry and Representative John Lewis. Well, I'm sorry we didn't, weren't able to do the technology to get the questions in. We're still working out the kinks. We don't have a huge budget, and we've got a lot of help from tech people, and we're doing what we can. Hopefully tomorrow we'll have a little more luck with people and get them tested and up uh, before we go on. I wanted to, uh, to continue with some themes that were part of my uh, introduction or remarks uh, here to the thing, and um, I think some things that have been in the news this year are important, and I wanted to do a short review. The United States has recently sanctioned assassinations of United States citizens. It's not clear whether that's here or abroad. The United States is assassinating select targets in war with drones. The United States is running death squads, specifically Dick Cheney was running death squads. Rumsfeld was operating death squads for assassination. Blackwater was being hired and used to do political assassinations. I tried to invite and didn't get Seymour Hirsch, Jeremy Scahill, who had told this story, and some of it is also in Bob Woodward's Dick book Cheney about Obama's war. Running death squads. Rumsfeld was operating death squads for assassination. Blackwater was being hired and used to do I'm doing that thing. I tried to invite and did okay. Thank you. Fujimoro in Peru and another country ran death squads and just got a 25-year sentence. Here, we can't impeach or bring any legal activity against these criminals. And that his, his rise in Peru had links to the CIA, who financed him and helped put him in. There are death squads operating currently in Afghanistan with covert operation group 3,000 people in size, and also in Pakistan. The covert operation and assassinations teams go into the countries we're about to attack before we get there selecting the targets and setting up the assassinations. It's important historically to understand that there were 400 unsolved political murders in the Weimar Republic in the, 19, end of the 1928 to 1932, which killed the labor leaders and the political organizers and the musicians and the dissidents and the people who could have spoken up against the rise of Hitler and silenced them. And a similar string of assassinations went on here from the time of the Kennedy assassination forward, continues to this day, and is done worldwide. At the same time, Luis Poseda Carriles, many of you know this name, an anti-Castro operative, was responsible for creating plane crashes, bombing buildings, assassinating uh, Mr. Letelier, the ambassador from Chile, when he was here in this country, and let he, he lives free in the United States in a country where we say that we don't want to support terrorists. If he isn't a terrorist, I don't know what he is. And yet, he can live here because he's the other kind of terrorist, the state terrorist, the sponsored terrorism, and the sponsored assassinations. Indonesian assassination squads have currently been getting U.S. aid, and it was not cut off by the Obama administration when they asked for do that, to do that. At the same time, they're worried about people that think like us, and a White House operative named Cass Sunstein, an aide there, and was also, he was also very involved in the secrecy question and had differences with many of us in the open government movement, has suggested cognitive penetration and cognitive dissonance into groups that study or assert conspiracies in order to create doubts. The State Department runs a debunking site on various conspiracies and, of course, lumps them all together 
Um, but the comments about the Kennedy assassination, pretty fatuous by Todd Leventhal, a disinformation expert there, uh, are based on his reading of the excellent and authoritative and final conclusions of Vincent Pugliosi. I noticed in the news that covert cell phones are starting to be the source of recording crimes internationally and things being re released that are picked up on cell phones. And I said a few years ago, if we'd had these cell phones that we have now in 1963 in Dealey Plaza, we'd know who killed Kennedy. So it's harder for them to do things entirely in secret. There's WikiLeaks and other things coming up on the, on the web and information is flowing. Uh, in August of uh, 2009, they paroled Squeaky Fromm, the attempted assassin of Gerald Ford. Also that year, they paroled Sarah Jane Moore, another Ford assassin, Arthur Bremer, assassin, the guy that shot um, George Wallace. And my response at the time was, it must be election season. The British um, MI6 agent, and he also corresponded and traveled to the NSA, so he crossed both those lines, was found dead in his, in his apartment, in his tub, inside of a sports bag, utility bag, zipped up and locked with a padlock, and it was ruled a suicide. It's only one of a number of amazing suicides that I've seen while I've gone along. John Carradine, the actor, was found hanging in a Bangkok closet. And a second autopsy was sought by none other than Michael Bodden, one of the supporters of the House Select Committee, in the assassination. But even he said that it wasn't a suicide with John Carradine. And actors and musicians and other people are killed for political reasons. Musharraf, the president in uh, Pakistan, and the Pakistani military intelligence ISI were complicit in the assassination of Madame Bhutto according to a released UN report. New documents that have been made available to the National Security Archive from Freedom of Information Act show that the CIA had plans to destabilize and assassinate our Benz in Guatemala in the 1950s. It came out recently at this, uh, also, uh, that um, FBI records were released under Freedom of Information Act that the FBI was tracking Paul Wellstone who became a senator back when he was an anti-war activist, and tracking him up to the day of and following his death, and were looking into threats against him, the plane that he was in, and the plane crash, and then the NTSB ruled that it was all pilot error, even though there's many remaining questions. The, D the FBI was on scene almost before they could have gotten there from Minneapolis. There was an article just recently I found interesting because it parallels the things that they, they talk about Kennedy's Addison disease and whether it could have killed him any, anyway. Now somebody's uh, petitioning to get a sample, uh, I think from uh, some blood that was on a, a scarf at the pillow that he died on of Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, and get his DNA to see if he had a rare blood cancer that would have killed him anyway. Other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? The woman, there's a new book called The Woman Who Shot Mussolini. Uh, she didn't succeed in killing him by Brenda Wineapple about a woman named Violet Gibson. And the use of assassinations for political purposes from the bottom and from the top has been part of the history for some years. Infernal Devices is a good book about this. A new book called The World That Never Was begins to track political assassinations through time. Their use is first against the state or the attentat of the Russian anarchists who believed that if you killed the Tsar, the system would fall apart, to first the police response to, and then the police penetration of, and the police creation of such assassinations in order to justify state repression and provocateur incidents. And that pattern follows us up to the current day, including the assassinations we study, where we're given a false assassin to hide the identity of the real assassins and also hide the purpose. In the JFK case this year, Jim Douglas has been making since his talk to us an interesting analogy between President Obama's position and JFK's position in 1963. Obama has been trying to normalize relations and open relations with Cuba and reach a detente. He's called for uh, the end of stockpiling of nuclear weapons and to start toward a full nuclear um, 
disarmament, which was what Kennedy called for in June of 63. He's at odds clearly with the Joint Chiefs and the people that are running these wars. Uh, he's had several threats, in my view, from Robert Gates, who openly criticizes his positions, and many of the people running these wars are insubordinate to him and speak out against anything that he says and clearly are running the show. Uh, you may have seen something about an incident where uh, someone came into, I believe it was an Indian ambassador, had a, um, a, a White House visit and they had like a state event. And two people on a reality TV show crashed the event somehow and came in. Well, people may think, well, that's just an unusual thing. You don't get vetted at the gate to go into the White House to a meeting like that. You get vetted months in advance. The Secret Service pulled off that evening and failed to give any information about it to the social secretary who got blamed for it. But if I can put someone in the room with the president, with or without a weapon, I can kill the president. Just think about that. And so it's a message that he's vulnerable. The Indian ambassador was vulnerable at the time, too, because of political differences that they had with what they wanted to do in relation to U.S. policy. Then there was an article in the New York Times, the last paragraph of which uh, was a throwaway about Gates flying back from his meeting in Pakistan to get Pakistani military to go along with the anti-terrorist activity in that area. And it said on the 14-hour flight back to the United States, and they wouldn't tell us this about Hillary or anybody else, so that's why I say it's a throwaway in the last paragraph, it said that Gates was relaxing by watching a movie called Seven Days in May about a military takeover of the presidency in a coup in the United States. That's what he's watching to relax. It was, also came out that Clinton was separated from the nuclear launch code for the black box for a period of months. And I tracked in each of the major political assassinations, JFK, the Reagan shooting, even 9-11, the president is separated from nuclear command and control by a variety of methods. Uh, there have been continuing threats against Obama. Uh, a Fort Stewart PTSD veteran held a hostage situation and then revealed that he had plans to kill both Obama and Clinton. That's interesting. They're on opposite sides of the democratic polity, politics. The Clintons don't like Obama. Kennedy supported Obama. But he's going to kill them both. And another reason that JFK possibly came under the attack that he did, and there were many, Walt talked about the military industrial congressional contact. That was a second draft. The original draft was the military industrial intelligence complex that Eisenhower was going to war about. And the intelligence aspect is even more important because the defense intelligence is the largest intelligence agency, 85% of the budget. Office of Naval Intelligence is the old, oldest. Oswald was Naval Intelligence. Ruby was Naval Intelligence. Bannister was Naval Intelligence. There's naval intelligence footprints all over the assassinations and also army intelligence and the king and other operations later. Fletcher Prouty revealed to us that the CIA comes up with a plan, but they go to the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, covered out, carried out. You can read 600 books about the CIA. I challenge you to name me more than two or three that have ever been written about the DIA, even though it's running the budget. All the new directors of intelligence are from the DIA, not from the CIA or the civilian side, and they've controlled the budget since the inception of the intelligence agencies. And we mo know almost nothing about them because they are the real intelligence and spy agency. But JFK, at the time in his presidency, was also near the end proposing an Apollo mission to the moon that would have been carried on jointly with the Russians rather than in opposition to them. And uh, it was the beginning of, again, a move toward detente that he revealed in April. Interesting CIA records that have recently been released also showed us this year that the United States intelligence agencies never thought or believed that Gary Powers' U-2 spy plane was shot down by the Russians. Neither did the researchers. The question is, was he defecting voluntarily, which is what the CIA documents suggest, or was his plane sabotaged in order to in turn sabotage the detente between Khrushchev and Eisenhower and continue the Cold War? But as many of you who studied the assassination know, there's an interconnection between Powers and, o and Oswald and Oswald's U2 uh, stuff, and so it, it's, it's not an abstract story. 
a new book is just out, and I think some of the authors are speaking tomorrow at the Sixth Floor Museum, called The Kennedy Detail. And they're saying that the Secret Service agents in the Kennedy Detail in Dallas that day uh, were, are going to end their silence, and they're going to speak out after 50 years. And Gerald Blaine, the author of the book, says that this, their speaking out in the book will destroy the conspiracy theory cottage industry. This is in an article where they then quote Clint Hill, who ran up from the car behind and pushed Jackie back into the seat, climbed over the trunk. What does Clint Hill say? He says he ran forward when he saw Kennedy hit in the front and he lurched to his left. And then he gets up onto the car around the time of the headshot. And what does he say about the headshot? He says, a bullet entered the right front of Kennedy's head. That's Malcolm Kilduff at the hospital, pointing here, the entrance point. And he said it blew a hole the size of a fist out of his head. Well, he can't see the right side of Kennedy's head. He's seeing back here at the occipital, which is what all the doctors at Parkland saw, the back of Kennedy's head blowing out from a shot from the front. And he also talked about all the blood and brain matter coming back over the trunk to the left, where he was running up to. So while the one guy saying our book will prove there's no conspiracy, the details that are given in the same interview with Clint Hill back us up and support our version uh, of the events. There was a Texas A&M statistics study, Cliff Spiegelman, a professor there, that belies the bullet-led chemistry conclusions of the Warren Commission. And there was information out in a movie out about the Valkyrie plot on Hit Adolf Hitler, an assassination plot, that was actually involved Alan Dulles. And one of the major uh, military people that carried out the plot and then was spirited out of the country, Hugo Banthius, made his arrangements to get out, out and also his arrangements to kill Hitler through Mary Bancroft, the mistress of Alan Dulles. The Valkyrie plot involved the manipulation by the military of a continuity of government operation that was planned for the situation when Hitler would die and how the Third Reich government would continue in the hands of people who would then suppress uh, the, uh, many people for the assassination, which was their pattern. These officers figured out that if they killed Hitler and could blame it on the SS, then the military could arrest the SS, put them in jail, and retain some change of control over the situation. Unfortunately, the bomb that went off under the table, the table was between the bomb and Hitler, and he didn't die. And many of these people you know, were captured, but that was a plot that involved the U.S., and it's a plot that involves planning for government operations and emergencies that parallel the continuity of government plans and martial law plans we have in the United States. There was an article that Castro, Fidel Castro feared a U.S. invasion after JFK was shot. That's also in a National Security Archives release. D.A. Watkins here, who we approached, uh, the, the D.A. here in Dallas, um, when he found papers from uh, Wade, one of the uh, attorney generals and prosecutors back then, the D.A., uh, about the Kennedy case, we said that those are properly in the purview of the Assassination Records Act and they should go to the National Archives. There's articles, I don't know if it's been implemented, but saying that he was sending them to the Sixth Floor Museum instead, in which case I doubt we'll see much of them. Although this weekend they said that they were going to open a reading room uh, that the public can get access to certain hours. I don't know how much of what they have will be in the reading room or not. Jackie Kennedy's interviews with uh, Arthur Schlesinger that she asked to be buried for 50 years are going to come out soon through Carolyn Kennedy, who's releasing a new book on it for the 50th anniversary of, of, uh, of Kenny, Kennedy coming into office. And there may be details in there, like in the Manchester book that she suppressed that will throw light on the assassination. There's another book that bears reading. I haven't read it myself yet, but I'm sure it has details that are important, called The Kennedy Assassination 24 Hours After LBJ's Pivotal First Day as President by Steve Gillen. And what happened that day was, was important in terms of the shift to power. We have our old pal Gus Russo at the same time writing articles titled, Did Castro Okay the JFK Assassination? With his usual mix of disinformation. Um, and sadly, the topic has been reduced to such a level that there was performance art that took place by one of the current musical artists, stripping naked in Dealey Plaza, falling down, having fake blood come out of her head, 
and going to jail. And then somebody cued me to, I don't watch TV, but they put me onto an excerpt from CSPN, the sports network, where somebody called in to the host and he said, I don't, you're not one of those conspiracy theory people, are you? You don't seem to me like that. I don't know how they got on the topic. And then uh, the guy says, uh, no, but he said, I, I like to read about the theories. And the guy says, well, l l give me some sporting odds then. What, is the, what are the sporting odds that Oswald acted alone? And then he says, oh, well, that's probably a million to one. And he said, well, what about that the mob did it? And he says, oh, that's probably like five to six. But talking about these theories as if there's something you can give betting odds on rather than there's something you have to research as a historical fact. It, I feel, and I've said this before, that intellectual discussion and debate and historicity has been reduced to one word by the 1990s, the word whatever. Whatever. And in the Martin Luther King case, a new book, another piece of garbage, Hellhound on His Trail by Hampton Sides, which ignores the real evidence and just tries to show that Ray, for whatever purposes, was stalking Martin Luther King. Uh, another book scheduled to come out that's going to blame the mob for it. And the counter to that on our side is that T. Carter, who's with us this weekend, has written a memoir of injustice with Jerry Ray, uh, uh, the brother of James O. Ray, that tells the real story of what happened to him and how he was set up. And William Pepper is working on it. He had a third book. He already did Orders to Kill and Acts of State. He has a third book about to come out with new evidence that supports his position. Another important thing that happened on television is that Tavis Smiley, a very well-known African-American commentator, did a show called MLK, A Call to Conscience, and I have a copy of it if we want to watch it. It focuses on Dr. King's speech, Vietnam and Beyond, given on April the 4th, 1967, at Riverside Church in New York, where he called for an end to the war in Vietnam, and he said that the United States was the greatest purveyor of violence in the world, a year to the day before he was killed. And this raises, from many civil rights leaders, their thought that that was the nail in his coffin and the reason that he was killed a year later. It also came out that the sermon he had planned to give at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta when he got back on April 5th, had he lived, was titled, Is America Going to Hell? So that was a speech we never heard, but I think he understood what was the matter with this country at that point and was saying too much about it. It also came out this year that Ernst Withers, a photographer, beloved in the Civil Rights Movement, they have his pictures at the, at the Civil Rights Museum, he's got a special, separate museum, he took pictures of everybody. It turns out that for years he was a paid informant of the FBI, giving them close-in information about the people in the civil rights movement. Um, he developed film at his shop for a person named Joseph Lau, L-O-U-W. Lau was the only person up on the balcony that actually saw King killed, and when he described it, he tells the truth. He said King was lifted up off his feet, and he was spun to his right. Well, a bullet from up there in the rooming house does exactly the opposite. And so, even though he said that and was making a documentary film, he said he was from South Africa, about King's struggle and the movement for the sanitation workers that King was leading, it turns out that he himself was an employee of the CIA. And he went to Withers photo, photo, Photography Shop to do it. Merrill McCullough, people may remember as the person in the famous photo of the AIDS pointing, with King in his arms. A, an undercover agent of the Me Memphis police who was also with the Office of Naval Intelligence and now currently works at the Central Intelligence Agency. So these people were completely around King and then to try to exonerate Withers they quote one guy who had been the head of the militant group called the Invaders and supposedly the most feared man in Memphis who was calling for the overthrow of the government and he's quoted when Withers, this comes out about Withers being an FBI agent, he says Oh, he was my daddy. He says he gave me money and he gave me advice and I still know the family. Well, what does that tell you? That he's the daddy of the most dangerous man in Memphis and he's an FBI informant. It tells me that the FBI was running some of these operations, knowingly or not. Why are they giving money to their, to their opposites unless it's to encourage the response? Then Andy Young was quoted when it came out 
and he said it didn't make any difference, they weren't doing anything illegal anyway, and that Dr. King would have probably been happy that one of the brothers was making a little money on the side. And Dick Gregory responded saying, if that's what he thought about Dr. King and he hated King that much, what does he think about the rest of us? This was not innocent information that was being given, it was information that helped them kill Dr. King, about his travel and where he was and where he was staying, the setup that moved him to the Lorraine Motel, the other motel downtown, and I, in my research, think that Andy Young had a role in the setup of Dr. King that day. It was in the news that William Bro, a CIA agent who was called a man for all seasons, uh, according to Richard Helms, another covert operator, led covert operations against uh, uh, the progressive Allende government in Chile, just died in his 90s, and he's praised, and he was part of dirty tricks and assassination plots. In the Malcolm X case, Thomas Hayer or Hager has been paroled, the, one of the three, the actual gunman of the three people that was that was put in jail, that were put in jail for killing Malcolm. The other two did not shoot Malcolm. And Hager said that at his trial and he was ignored. And the other two got out sooner than he did, but he was just paroled. And at the same time, uh, the shotgun killer, a large guy with the overcoat that brought a shotgun up and shot Malcolm, has been identified by an eyewitness that was at our New York meeting who was sitting in the front row and was asked to leave his usual seat by Malcolm's security, which it turned out were working for New York Special Forces and FBI themselves. And in his place came the three gunmen, and he was sitting in the front row a little ways down from them. He saw them clearly get up and shoot Dr. Or Malcolm X, and they, he knew their identities. Then he was pulled in, his name is Roland Shepard, he was pulled in by the New York police to sweat him, not for information about who shot Malcolm X, but for information about Malcolm X's movement and the members of it, and to give them intelligence. He, got, he didn't like the sweating, he said he had to go to the bathroom. He got up to go to the bathroom, and coming out of the bathroom was the shotgun man, who went over and sat at his desk in the New York Police Department and this Bureau of Special Services there uh, where he worked. His name is William Bradley, and he was recently in a political ad in New Jersey, and Roland Shepard recognized him. So he's been identified, but clearly nobody's doing anything about it. There's a new book list that's too long to go into. There's a Jesse Ventura show that aired tonight that maybe we'll catch online or be able to show about the Kennedy assassination. I know it has an interview I did with Prouty. Uh, in it, but what else it shows, I don't know. But Jim, uh, Dick Russell, one of our researchers from COPA, has been working with Ventura, and they made him wait the first season before he could do anything on JFK. And um, so there's, there's other books that are coming out and have come out. Some of them will be highlighted by the speakers this week, but uh, information and records continue to be released that tell us the truth about this historical period and this situation. And that's really, in the end, what we're about. We're about history, and we're about reality, and we're about calling the lie to much of what the government tells us is how we got here. The reason I want to open a Museum of Hidden History in D.C. is that most people in America on 9-11 said, why would anybody be mad at us? Well, we're the last people on Earth who don't know why anybody would be mad at us. But if we knew what had been done in our name from the end of World War II forward in other countries, we would understand. It doesn't justify mass murder. It doesn't mean that the Twin Towers should have been blown up or all those people killed. That was a crime against humanity. But we're living in a vacuum of denial in this country. And not only about what happens abroad, but what little bit of democracy we have left here. And that was the light that I think Penn Jones was holding up, up till the time of his sickness with Alzheimer's and his death, by going to Dealey Plaza as we continue to do at his request every year on the anniversary of the assassination of John F. Kennedy to at least call with as many of us as are left for the truth of what this society is and to preserve it. So I hope those staying to Monday will come out there with us and I hope you'll enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks for your time.
break their silence after nearly 50 years. Um, why didn't they just save Gerald Fulton from trouble? <laughs> well, I mean, these are not, what was the silence imposed by is the question. Yeah. <laughs> you know, why were you silent about such an important thing for yeah, 50 I mean, years? And now you're a hero because you're going to come out and say, you know, we're all wrong. But I mean, you know, uh, why, were, why weren't they asked these kind of questions more specifically by the Warren Commission or the House Select yeah. Committee? You know, th that's the question. It's not that they're breaking their silence. It's how could they have been allowed to be silent for so long? Yeah, that's how I meant they could say it's Gerald Fulton is a troubler. Yeah. It's amazing. Well, Posner was not troubled by nothing. Most of the interviews in his book, he never took with the people that he quotes. So, he, in other words, they didn't really cause that much of a problem for him? No, I mean, he, I, he, like many of the hacks that write against us, I believe, are given the scripts, yeah. you know, uh, by the agencies, and they put out their garbage, and then they get all the press. But the media loves them because if there was no conspiracy, the media didn't do anything wrong. So that's why they don't want to say there was one, because then they were complicit in the cover-up themselves. And so it's much easier to bring forward someone like Posner to say Oswald acted alone and you know, Ray acted alone and uh, you know, all of that. But he was on an MSNBC show with Ariana Huffington, who's supposed to be a liberal. And they were talking about the fact I had been invited, without knowing who was inviting me, to a Orange County, California class on the JFK assassination. And I asked who's teaching it, who else is being invited to the class, and what time period. They never got back to me. The next thing I knew, someone called me and told me I better get the LA Times. Front page coverage above the fold in the LA Times on this class, which turned out to be a seminar, which included people that were funded by, and the whole operation funded by, a guy of the Board of Regents in Orange County who was tied with Spotlight Magazine and Willis Carto, and were putting forward the thesis that the Jews killed Kennedy, and were also Holocaust deniers. So my name is linked to them. The only thing they said was they couldn't get in touch with me, and I was an aficionado of Jim Garrison's theories, and Jim Garrison wasn't known to be an anti-Semite. So I'm being included in their nonsense in order to discredit me without knowing who they are. So I called the school and canceled. I called, I called David Parks, an editor I picked off the page in the LA Times and said, I want to respond. No one tried to call me. And I have nothing to do with these people and wouldn't. And he let me have an op-ed in the LA Times to say what COPA coming to the school could have given the students and across all the different academic disciplines with real information and history and forensics and all the things that we look at and how much better it would have been than these people talking about Holocaust denial. But then the article was mentioned that week on MSNBC on a show called Equal Time. I asked for Equal Time for this show later, and they told me we just call it Equal Time because it's run by women. And I said, I'm sorry, but Ariana Huffington is not Equal Time for women. And so she's on there with, guess who? Gerald Posner. And so she says to Posner, well, Gerald, the worst thing is that these Holocaust deniers were going to come and speak at the campus. And he says, that's not the worst thing. They were going to bring speakers who say there was a conspiracy in the assassination to kill John F. Kennedy. Hmm. So now we're worse than Holocaust deniers. Like this guy, John Judge. I don't know Posner from Diddle, but obviously he was given my book, Judge for Yourself, and so he's pulling, you know, his cue cards from it. And he says... <clears throat> like this guy, John Judge, who thinks there's a conspiracy behind every aspect of American history. And I said, he doesn't know me. My friends know that I think there are competing conspiracies behind every aspect of American history. It's not that simple. And then he says, and he thinks that the people at Jonestown didn't commit suicide. They were murdered. And Ariana and the two women burst out in braying laughter. And they say, oh, it was the Kool-Aid hit squad. Funniest thing. I wrote her a letter. I said, what's so funny? It's not me saying it, that's the Guinea's pathologist, Dr. Mutu, that's the ruling of the grand jury, not a single suicide at Jonestown. And what's so funny, of course she never wrote me back, but Posner says, yeah, it's a, you know, Kool-Aid hit squad. So all that I know that I did to get that and other bad press attention that, that week was that we filed the Freedom of Information Act for the Army Intelligence Surveillance on Dr. King in the last months of his life and up to the time of his assassination. And we did finally get an after-action report after going to court that showed that not only the FBI and the COINTELPRO and their RIBAT anti-communist program was spying on King, 
So was the CIA through Operation Chaos. So was the Army Intelligence through something called Lantern Spike, part of Garden Plot and Military Law Planning for the United States, supposedly an anti-riot group. And when I say spying, I'm talking about they knew what was in his garbage can. They knew in his planes and his buses and his travel operations. They had bugs in the room, multiple bugs. I don't know how each agency had to compete for the sound. But he was being spied on by a lot of them. And the first people to spy on the King family was Army Intelligence in the 1920s, who started with his grandfather and kept spying on him up to that time. And Dr. Pepper reveals that the real backup kill teams and the operators in that were from Army Intelligence. But that's what we've got. We've got these hacks that get a book and they become the expert on the people that do the real work get ignored. Yeah. Hey, John, when's uh, Arianna Huntington going to give uh, some uh, uh, web play to our side? You well, you'd have to ask her <laughs> through the so-called Huffington Post. But in my view, I mean, if you've heard of somebody, they're probably no damn good. Because the people I knew that do the real work never get any press, and they never get any mention, they never get any credit. If anything, they get dishonorable mention, like I did that week. They, they also had me on uh, Joe McLaughlin's hour. I mean, he knows even less about me than Arianna Huffington or Gerald Posner. But he says, did you see the latest Julia Roberts movie? It's really great. It's called Conspiracy Theory. He says it stars uh, Mel Gibson, who plays a and this is Joe McLaughlin, if you know who that is, this old Republican goat. He, sa he doesn't talk like this. He says he plays a jacked up, programmed MK Ultra assassin with a John Judge personality. <laughs> I mean, you know, I was polishing my buttons. You've got to do a lot of work to get that kind of dishonorable mention in the media, you know. So I got a couple of slams that week, and, uh, you know, it was worth the wait. But... You know, it, it's easier to discredit us. Somebody, some of my lectures years ago on the assassinations, people would ask the question, well, if, if this is true, why aren't you dead? And I said, well, first of all, it's a kind of a rude question. I mean, you, the Azalea Society meets, and somebody says, well, why aren't you dead? You know, there's no sense giving them ideas. But I said, the only thing I can tell you is either, A, I'm so unimportant that they don't care to bother to kill me, I'm not a witness to anything, or B, they leave me alive to discredit me. Probably the latter. It's easier to, to smear me than it is to kill me. Why bother? If anything, I'm probably an amusing bellwether to them. Oh, look, he figured that out, but he missed this. You know. But uh, I agree with William S. Burroughs. Paranoia is having all the facts. Thanks. Reconnoitered, we have to move all the sound stuff over there, but we'll go to the back room. And they should, I'll call the hotel and try to get a shuttle.